Okay. Last week we went through all the different technologies that we're going to be covering. And tonight we're going to be covering two, two of those technologies. The unit testing and the hibernate. Okay. Um, and the way that we're developing this project is in an agile type of development. And if you guys want to read more about it, you can go to the agilemodeling.com website which tells you everything that you need to know about Agile development. But the one section that I suggest you read, if you don't read anything else, is the Agile Modeling Best Practices. Because that's going to tell you exactly what everybody out there does when they do Agile development. Okay, And this is pretty much what we're trying to do with the project, or the way that we're developing our project. And I say our project because I'm part of your project. I'm one of the stakeholders. I'm one of the um, um, one of the um, people involved in making sure that the project works and that it does what it's supposed to do. And basically what we've been doing is we've been documenting. We've been documenting continuously um, about the deliverables, you know, what is it that we're trying to create, what is it that we're trying to implement. Uh, we're also building a model, okay, and, and in fact for tonight you guys had to give it your first shot at that model. Who are your entities, your main entities in your in your project? What are their attributes, their characteristics? What is the relationship between them? And the idea is to put them in a model, okay? So that you guys have a pretty good high level idea of what you're trying to build. And then tonight, we're gonna start developing. And in fact, the way that we develop it in an agile uh, mode is by doing tests first. So you build a test upon the, upon the code and then you build a code that passes those tests. Okay, it's also called test-driven development. Test-driven development. TDD. Okay. Also, the book covers a little bit about extreme programming. Stream programming is one of the several agile processes. In fact, the one that we're going to be using the most is the agile software development. What is exactly the agile software development? <coughs> Probably the most important thing to know about agile method or processes is that there is no such thing as agile development or process. It's the team that is part of the development that is the one that is agile. So <coughs> Basically, you know, the most important thing to know is that, um, and this is because of the nature of computer science, as you most know, computer science is a very young science. I mean, consider with the other sciences, uh, computer science is almost more considered like an art, more an art than a science, okay? And computer programmers, for the most time, or initially, at least, um, were trained by engineers. And if you're an engineer and you're building a, a, a bridge or a building or whatever, um, the, the engineer process of building is very specific. Uh, you have to have the model and the design way layout ex exactly as it's going to be before you actually start building it. And since we were taught by engineers, we thought that the building of software was going to be the same way. 
and it turns out that software is not built that way. Uh, if you build software the same way that you build in a building or, or a bridge, you end up with a piece of software that usually it's not going to do what they want, they meaning the stakeholders or the end users, or some down, sometime uh, down the road, they're going to change their mind. They're going to say, you know what, we really don't want this feature, or we would like to include these other features. So the only, the only certainty about software development is that the requirements will always be changing. Always. So that means that you cannot spend a whole time in designing it and then implementing it because later on some of that design is going to change and the implementation is going to have to change. So you don't want to have to do all the design process up front. You just do a little. You implement it, you test it, you deploy it. You make sure that the stakeholders, the users of your system l like it, give you feedback on what they don't like, okay? And then you go back to step one. You change the design, you implement it, you make new tests, and then you deploy it again. And that's in an iterative way. That's how software is created today. And that's called the agile development process. Okay, And that's how we're going to be developing the project that you are developing. What's the best tool to use that, uh, to use to, to be able to build it that way? Wiki. Wiki is a repository of documents. In fact, Wiki is almost like a living database of documents and requirements that everybody can collaborate on. And in this case, it's you and me collaborating on your Wiki in helping you build the project. Okay? Uh, so I suggest uh, if you have some time just read a little bit about agile modeling and about the agile process online. Okay? Uh, you guys have worked on your problem statement. At this point, this is the fourth week. You should know pretty, pretty well what you're going to build. I mean, you should have almost like a very good picture and at least 10 functional requirements. This is something that I give everybody feedback on the wiki. I need to see 10 distinct, distinct functional requirements. I don't want functional requirements that are going to be um, repeated just because they are um, stated in a different way <laughs> um, because I'm not going to accept and I'm not going to accept that um, <coughs> and then for tonight you guys were supposed to give it a, uh, a shot at the first at the first domain model um, to do that you could use a tool like this one violet UML <coughs> and this is the domain model that comes um, in the book for Timex and I think we already reviewed a little bit of it um, the main entities just by taking the nouns out of the problem statement and try to figure out which ones are more important than the other ones we have determined that in Timex employee, timesheet, time, department and status are the most important um, entities. And we have decided to create this diagram that will show the relationship between them. So one employee has or manages zero more timesheets. And then a timesheet contains zero more times. In fact, a timesheet contains exactly seven times for a weekly timesheet. Also, uh, <coughs> a timesheet has one and only one status. Okay? And the time.
time is charged to always one department. So all the times in a timesheet are charged to only one department. That's the way we decided to do it, to keep it simple. Is that how it is in the real world? Well, mo probably not. Probably when you work a whole week and you charge time, you probably ch uh, work a little bit um, for one department and some, al uh, some other time from the same week to another department. But the idea for now is to keep things simple. So given that, this will be the UML diagram equivalent to that. Notice that status, and this is the way that you should look at it and the way that you should specify it. Status doesn't have enough attributes of its own to make it a whole entity. In fact, status doesn't have any attributes. Status is just a value that you assign to a timesheet. What are the possible statuses we said? The first time that the employee creates a timesheet, then it's a pending timesheet. Then when finally the employee uh, fills out the timesheet completely and submits it to the, his or her boss, then it will be a submitted timesheet. And then the boss will look at it and say, yeah, accept it or no, I reject it. And then it will change the status either to accept or, accept it or reject it. And so status becomes just a, an attribute of the timesheet. In fact, here it is. Status becomes one of the attributes of the timesheet. Okay? So that's something that you've got to decide from. The problem statement, which gives a really broad description of what you're building, take out the, no the nouns, put them out there. That's going to be a list of your main entities. And then you start to figure out, hey, which ones are the most important ones? Which ones are just attributes of the other ones? Okay? Timesheet is definitely the most important entity in our project. In fact, the title of the project contains the word timesheet. That's how important it is. Okay. Also, another entity that we didn't that we couldn't find a lot of attributes was time. I mean, how what attributes can time have? Maybe hours, minutes, and seconds. Maybe, I don't know, um, time zone, which are really irrelevant in this case for the project. So time becomes attributes or the different, the seven times that a weekly timesheet contains becomes the attributes of the timesheet. So you're going to find that there's hours for the Monday, there's hours for Tuesday, there's hours for Wednesday, all the way down to hours for Sunday. I didn't write them all. So at this point, timesheet, the main entity, contains status and times as their attributes. It also contains ID. We need to identify each individual timesheet from all the other ones. We also need to know what's the period ending date of the timesheet. Yeah, this is a weekly timesheet from but from when? So we have decided that all the timesheets, the period ending date is going to be the Sunday that ends that week. And that's going to be very important because that's going to decide one of the business rules in our project. Period ending date means calculate what's the Sunday from today to be able to figure out when does this week end. Okay? And also, it needs to know whose timesheet is this for. So we have included the employee ID as a foreign key. And we also need to know what, ti what uh, this timesheet is going to be charged to, what department. So we're going to include the department code also as a foreign key. And that pretty much um, makes up the timesheet entity, which at this point you have thought of it so much and you have almost nailed it down um, perfectly that you can actually create a table in the database like it and Hibernate, which is going to be the framework that we're going to be covering today, it's going to do an automatic conversion from the table to the objects for you. 
in Java. Okay. What else? Employee. Employee, yes, it has enough attributes for us to consider it as a separate entity. In fact, employee has a name, ha has a date of birth, it has a password. In this case, it has a username because we have to be able to authenticate uh, each one of the employees. So the ID is going to be the number that identifies each individual employee, and also it's going to serve the purpose of the username. Does it have to be that way? No. You could create a username as a separate attribute if you wanted to. Okay. And then finally, the department, yes, the department is barely uh, an entity of, of the model uh, because it has a name. It has a name and we have to uniquely identify all the different departments so it has a code. So that's about it. So at this point that we know what the model looks like, we'll go ahead and create our database. Now, like I said, Last week, when you create the database, make sure that you create them with keys, primary keys. So ID is the primary key of timesheet, ID is the primary key of employee, and code is the primary key for department. Okay? But when you create the foreign keys, do not create the foreign keys at the database level. In other words, don't enforce referential integrity of, of foreign keys in the table. You know that they're going to be foreign keys, but you don't tell the database about it because that's going to be managed by Hibernate. Okay, so at this point, you can just save this model or export it into an image file, and that's what was due for tonight. Now, once you have done that, then at this point, Oh, I'm going to show you guys. This is some of the projects that I have graded thus far. And I'm going to show you four of the best ones that I consider really good. And they are more in line to what I was expecting for for last week. This is the first one. Uh, real estate marketing. Notice how the web page has a very sharp professional looking uh, professional look. I'm sorry. And this is all done because of the use of cascading style sheet. And that's something that you can, you know, that this is the feedback that I gave many of you guys. Just go out there. I'm not expecting you to create it from scratch. If you like something out there, and there's plenty of websites that are open source that you can download and adapt to your project, like the open open source web design dot org. Open open web design. What is it? Open web design dot org. Oh, OS. There you go. So this one has 2,080 free designs that you can look at until you're totally bored of looking at them and you finally decide which one you like and you just download the cascading style sheet and adapt it to your website. That's all you need to do. <laughs> I mean, really, how difficult could that be? And this is a perfect example of a website that does that. Okay. Now this is what I don't like about it. Notice that the menu seems to shift as I resize the page. Something to look at. So what do we have? We have a logo with a title on the top. Good. We have a top menu. Good, that's what I asked. We have a footer. Good. The menu could be on the top or could be on either one of the sides. And it uses cascading style sheets for the look.
look and feel. So every single page that this guy creates in this project is going to have the same look and feel just because he has that Kenny style sheet nailed down. Good job. This was a really good job. Another one that I liked um, was this one. Look at this one. This is called the Student Cloud. Okay, and he ha he created th this menu. Notice this is the logo. Okay, this is the title. This is going to be, you know, the main content. This is the footer. It's nice. It's pleasant, and it's not that difficult to create. Okay. Here's another one. This one he put the main page as the login which is fine. This is not what I expected or I wanted. In fact, I was very clear on the project that I said, you know, make sure that <coughs> create either a server or a JSP that will render your website's homepage, the one page you get to after login. Okay? So if I log in from here, this is where it will take me. take me. So this one has also the top logo. He has a left hand side menu. Okay. And then the content. And then there's a footer down here. So that gives you a pretty good idea of what I was expecting. <coughs> 